Hey, listeners, Dan Harris here, host of the 10% Happier Podcast. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles and originals like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible Originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash Harris or text Harris to 500-500. The weather is cooling down a bit. The leaves are starting to fall. Yes, it's that time of year again. Football season. And we all know the best part of any game day traditions are the ones that involve food. There's nothing like having everyone in your game day crew coming together to bring their best bites and argue over whose family makes the best chili. And while there's no need to mess with the perfection of game day classics, like a freshly grilled Oscar Mayer hot dog topped with Heinz ketchup and mustard, it's always fun to step out of your comfort zone and get creative with your recipes. Because there's nothing more fun than adding to your list of game day traditions, like making a creamy and delectable queso dip with Velveeta cheese that can be eaten with so much more than just chips. Now is the chance for people across the nation to find out whose game day eats reign supreme. It's your turn to show off your tasty game day food traditions. Go to www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to share a photo of your game day food tradition to enter to win $10,000. Once again, that's www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to enter to win $10,000. This is Full Change with Tom Laidlaw. I'm always excited about these shows, especially as a as a fan, as I was. You know, I was a little kid when you guys were. You're still not very big. Pamper, uh, I'm, you're you're going to say that with our guest today? That's, that's what you were talking about. Right. No, no. Jeez. He's a big man in my eyes. I'm 5'10", by the way. So, um, so this is a great one because this, this guy was so far ahead of his time. As a kid, the Rangers, the Islanders had all the scores, all the point guys. And then the Rangers got a 100-point score somehow. And he had a cool beard, and he was one of the Smurfs. And apparently he was your best man. Yeah, best roommate. I think it was John Rattel was the last 100-point scorer, right? Then they had Mike Rogers. So here we go. The great Mike Rogers is on today. Stash, Dash, and Bass. Was that the line in Hartford? Stash, Dash, and Bash? It was. What a crew that was. But uh, so, Yeah, you know, we, we, I don't know how we became successful, but we did. It was just one of those uh, magical moments when three guys get thrown together and everything worked. But uh, if you took us away from each other, uh, probably would have we probably would have had terrible careers. But, uh, yeah, just one of those uh, things that worked. Well, Mike and I became very good friends. Yes, he was my best man and another failed marriage, so it was his fault when that marriage fell apart. <laughs> Started off the wrong way. Picked the wrong guy to be my best man. That's when, why. When he asked you, Mike, were you like, don't you have any other friends? What? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, I really wanted to say no, but I knew he couldn't find anybody else. So I thought, <laughs> well, what the heck can I? You know, and where the venue was on a, on a boat and everything else, I thought, geez, you know, it's, it's just going to be a, a good cheap day for me. So I thought, why not? <laughs> you don't have to pay to get drunk. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, so I've got so many stories to tell about Mike and I. Obviously, you want to talk about hockey in a whole bit, but uh, one of our favorite pastimes, we would drive to the airport together, catch a flight. We'd always had to get a big bottle of wine. Tommy, the oh. wine had a handle on it, so it wasn't that. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a box, too. It was in a box. But then part of the problem, oh. we, we decided we'd throw some beer in with it, too. And then, oh, God. oh we can't be leaving this in the car. So when we oh. went to the toll booth, we throw it into the bin there where you threw the change in and just oh. dashed out of the rope. We never got caught. <laughs> And listeners, that's how your professional here oh, trained God. back in the eighties. Oh, okay. So do you remember when we got we got our wallet stolen when we were in San Diego or something like that? Do you remember that? That's remember the day that? I was going to quit hockey that night. But, but what I did didn't tell know until the next morning. But uh, yeah, I, why were we going to quit? Room and it's just ransacked, and and Tommy's still well, outside. Why, why, why were you going to Why were you going to quit hockey though? Why were you going to quit? Because I was upset. Remember, oh, I was just yeah. upset that somebody stole our wallets. Oh, okay. Into fine. our loop. what do you think? Well, so the guy went in the back door, the screen door. So Mike is trying to get in the front door. He's standing right beside me, and he thinks I'm inside, locking the door and not letting him in. And he said to Gresh, he says, Tommy won't let me in. I'm standing right beside him. 
<laughs> Wait, and you guys are all half in the bag at this oh, point, right? No, more than half in the bag. Okay. Yeah. We were full. Well, thank God I never got in because the guys were still, yeah. still yeah. Uh, stealing the stuff, ransacking the room. And so I thought, geez, if I get in there, you know, yeah. I might not have played hockey. The next Actually, was- really, it was, a, it was a blessing in disguise. You were just like, F this, I'm out when they stole your uh, stole your wallet? He quit well, so we had a practice, the practice that morning, and I'm still pretty shit-faced, so I'm going, oh, geez, I don't want to go to practice, number one. Now I've got an excuse, so I was telling Tommy, uh, this is it, I'm done, I'm not going to practice. And next, that was, you know, right, this is a regular, That's a regular thing with Mike, though. He was always quitting. He's had enough. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> so, okay. So now, him and I are really good friends, but it is my smart act as I am. Yeah, Mike used to do those old uh, co-host sticks. Right. And it would have the tape wrapped around it, like little red stripes. Yeah, sure. Yep. So I would take the saw and I would saw it about two thirds of the way through. And then he would go out there. And so most of the times he thought it was funny when he'd go to shoot and I'd, you know, like, okay, so he, he's not paying for the sticks. He just grab, grab another stick and he's fine. But there's this one day where he was not in a good mood. And I think I'd done, he had like four sticks left. And I think I cut about three of them. And he says, if you cut one more of my sticks, I'm leaving. I'm getting out. I could have quit that day too. So he goes, you know, I was telling somebody that story the other day. I, I'm still oh. skating uh, a couple of days a week. And I was telling somebody about that story. And I was I, exactly, I was so mad because I didn't have any sticks left. And I went, oh, he was laid law again, doing it to me. Oh God. And you know, everybody in the, the ice knows what's going on now. So yeah. they're all just dying laughing. Wait, was that the year you won player's player? It was, yeah. Because Mike voted for him. Mike voted for him, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> Oh God, he would get mad at me sometimes. And then he'd get mad, and then he soaked for a little while for a couple of days, and then he'd come and apologize to me because he got mad at me. But he, I was the one. Who was wow, what an abusive relationship that was! <laughs> My jeez. Oh yeah, I was. I was a sulker. I sulked oh, a lot. I yeah, you were. Yeah, but you always snapped out of it too, though. So where did you grow up? Where's home? Calgary, Calgary, oh. Alberta, Canada. Yeah, and uh, yeah, as soon as the career was over, uh, we moved back here. So yeah, I just played all my minor hockey here. Actually, played my junior hockey in Calgary, and then. Uh, Got drafted in the World Hockey Association by uh, Edmonton and NHL by Vancouver. Ended up going to the WHA for five years. And then I uh, got traded to Hartford during that time. And that time we were called the New England Whalers. And the NHL picked up four teams. I think it was Edmonton, Winnipeg, Quebec, and Hartford Hart- going to the NHL. So thank God, I you know, because as a kid, you don't, you don't dream of playing in the World Hockey Association. You dream of playing in the NHL. So... Thank God the merger came along and uh, we were one of the teams picked. And uh, yeah, then things just seemed to take off from there. Played in Hartford and then got traded to New York and then traded to Edmonton at the very end of my career. And when that was over, moved back to Calgary. Uh, I did the radio for the Calgary Flames for 12 years, a color analyst. And now I moved back here and uh, kind of kind of semi-retired. Still got a, a little business going, which uh, I'm really excited about. So things are going well. Right? That's great. And Mike, thanks for coming on. Thanks yeah, I just think show's over. <laughs> He stole the whole life story. <laughs> Wait, can we go back to, can you talk about um, the WHA? Because you played with Gordie Howe in, in New England, right? I did. Uh, you know, I was so fortunate. And and you look back at your career and unfortunately never won a Stanley Cup. So, you know, it really makes my career is is, is the people I got to, to know and the people I got to play with. And as a kid growing up, I had two idols and it was Gordie Howe and Dave Keon. And Next year, I know I'm in, in Hartford playing with Gordie Howe and Dave Keon. And, and my oh. first game in the NHL, I've got Gordie Howe on my right wing and Dave or er, and uh, Mark Howe on my left wing. Oh, how cool is and, that? Wow. You know, you kind of look left and then right and you say, okay, this is pretty cool. I, I finally made it now when you're on the ice with Gordie Howe. Oh. So uh, the World Hockey, um, you know, it, it was probably, I think, the most monumental uh, thing that ever happened in, in hockey because it, it really changed the whole landscape of, of what was going on. The players at that time weren't get, getting paid much. All of a sudden, this rival league comes in. They're pulling a lot of star players from the NHL because of, of, of throwing dollars, throwing cash at them. And so it kind of changed for the players at least. Um, you know, the, the salaries went up, the terms of the contracts went up. So it was a really important time for uh, for hockey in general. And you know, it gave me a place to play. I, 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 the reason I went to Edmonton, I was almost guaranteed a spot on the team. And as a rookie, um, Vancouver more or less said, well, we're not sure about you. We'll probably send you the minors. And, and obviously got more money in the WHA and, uh, and just had a, an, an excellent rookie season and, uh, kind of things just progressed from there. So Davey Keon, I remember, uh, remember they had a rule back then. It was my first year in the league in 80, 81, that there was a fight going on. You had to separate. And if you didn't separate, you're going to get a 10 minute misconduct. So I was supposed to be somewhat of a tough guy. So I uh, I went to, I, yeah, I went to a, a Davy Keon's hockey school when I was a kid. So I'm out the ice and I'm standing right beside him during somebody's fight. And I'm like, just like you, I'm like, wow, I'm in the NHL. This is Davy Keon out of the ice there. 
Well, they ended up getting a 10 minute was contract. So all my buddies go, you're in the NHL. You're supposed to be tough. You're beating up Dave Kian. Like, what do you think? He's like, <laughs> he's like five foot eight. Oh, and he was like 80 years old by then too. Yeah. Uh, well, whenever those things happen, I'd grab Dave Keon and he was on my team because he might have been the only guy I could beat up. So, <laughs> well, Tom, that, so Tom, your hit list is that Robin Picard and then Dave Keon. Yeah, so you're a real definitely. tough guy. Yeah, real tough. <laughs> definitely. So, you played your junior hockey where? In Calgary. Calgary, okay. So, basically, yeah. you're just, you never left home. You're just, no, a team called the Calgary Centennials. And, uh, and, you know, back then there weren't many hometown players that played for their for their for their team, and and I was just fortunate enough that uh, you know the Centennials wanted me, and uh, and actually even lived at home during that time, had a a, a billet with us. So uh, yeah, it was at times it was great being at home, and at times if you had a bad game, it was pretty shitty being at home because you knew you were going <laughs> to right. get talked to a little bit after the game. Mom and Dad were huge hockey fans, and if I didn't play well, they let me know about it. So oh. it was. Uh, but it was, it was, it was uh, you know, you, you look back and Tommy, I know you played college, but you probably look back at college and I look back at junior and, and the best times I ever yeah. had. In college. Yeah. Cause it was, True. you know, you, you weren't there yet. You, you were, you were striving to be a great player, but the fun you had, you know, you were still a kid, you're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. And then, you know, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. I know. And everybody's making the same money. There's no families involved. So it's just the guys getting together on bus trips and plane trips and everything. We had a blast. I'll tell, tell you what, though. And I, I really mean it. And you're right. College was fantastic. I know junior was great for you. But that group of guys we had in the early 80s there when you were there with the Rangers, and we had a really good team, like good group of guys, too, right? Like, we had a lot of fun together. We really did. And and I look back at that time, that team, and, and we were darn good. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I, I, yeah. still, I still tell people I think we should have won the Stanley Cup that year. Unfortunately, yeah. we got against the Islanders, and they just had that mystique. I think yep. over the Rangers and, but geez, you know, we brought in all the guys, the U.S. guys that played for the Olympic team. And, uh, and you know, you know what amazed me about that team though, Tommy, and I don't, don't know if you remember the year before you guys, uh, the Rangers go to the Stanley cup final. Yeah. We start the season the next year. And I believe there was 10 or 11 new players on the, on the opening day lineup. Yeah. I've told so, people that story too, because Freddie Shiro got, so that was my first year in the league. We went, Freddie right. Shiro got fired halfway through the year and Craig Patrick took over. And then we had that run. We went to the semifinals, but it was still a good run. And typically, if that happens, you're not changing players. You're coming back with the same no, team. No, not at all. Do you remember when Herb came into it? Herb came in the first meeting, and it was like, you know, all these changes are happening. We just went to the semifinals. But when he spoke, he spoke like, okay, this is it. This is the way it's going to be. There's no confusion. He was totally confident. He knew exactly, in his mind, he was doing that. He may have been nervous as heck behind the scenes, but he really gave the, 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 um, the impression that he was totally confident. He knew what he wanted. He knew the players he wanted, and that was it. But you know what's great about those teams, Tommy, is that, you know, we were a talented bunch and, and you know, we had a good game plan and everything else, but we were a very close-knit team. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, and I don't know how many times after practice we'd go to the old pub and rye there, and, yeah. and but, you know, it just wasn't two or three guys. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes there'd be 15 guys, sometimes a dozen guys, and, yeah. and, and some guys would just stop in for one quick beer, and some of us would make sure we stay all afternoon. But, you know, yeah. I, I think it was it was by far the the, the closest knit team that I'd ever been on those 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 three or four years that oh, I, we were good and it was it was just it was it was a great team and then the camaraderie in the dress room and everybody wanted to play for one another and yeah, I, really I think that was really cool about our team yeah so you, the the fans may not understand that dynamic right they, now that the game is different they're not sitting around drinking beers together now like we did in the past it may sound kind of barbaric that that was part of the team culture but it really brought everybody together like Mike saying. And you can't make guys go to that. They're adults or men. They can go do what they want to do. But like Mike said, everybody felt like kind of a responsibility to be with their teammates and have a certain sure. beer. So, yeah. Well, the fans think you guys are all brothers. They think you guys yeah. love each other. And, you, and when it goes wrong, people are, are kind of flabbergasted. Like, how did that, how did this team have no chemistry? But yeah. no, that team, you could see it. And you you guys were probably the second best team in hockey for a few yeah. years there. And unfortunately, the best team was just, you know. Mike, do you, do you remember what we did the night before? I think we were roommates. The night before the big game, game five, when Kenny Morris scored the overtime goal. Do you remember what we did the night before in our room? Can we say this on the air? Yeah, sure we can. Okay. Yeah. No, that's not. Is that when we broke into the bar fridge? No. We, no, no, not that. We, no, it was, it was, we did that a <laughs> lot. So we were playing Trivial Pursuit. We had half the team on one side and half the team on the other. We played, All right, yeah. Pursuit. And it breaks out into a brawl in our room. <laughs> we had Steve, Steve Richard, for whatever reason, put the garbage can on top of his head. And we're all punching the garbage can. Huh? Steve Richard. Wait, are you guys, then with beers flowing? Oh, no, no. There was, a, there was a bottle of wine, but it was snow. It was the night before a game, so guys maybe were having a little sip or something. And uh, let's just, so but, let's just act like. Yeah. I'm the guy that ends up with the garbage can on my head. Yeah. Oh. Thanks very much. 
We broke the chair. The guy in the team, and I'm the guy getting beat. Oh, we broke the chair too, and the, oh, yeah. the, the desk chair. So months later, Joey Bucchino was like the team manager or whatever. He calls me up because like he's thinking like he got the bill from the hotel. He says, "What did you guys do in the hotel room the night before?" <laughs> How how tough was that that loss to take? Because you guys had that. That was the drive for five. They were you know they were going to win five cups. And you guys were right there. You tied up late, and then well, we should have actually won at the game before. We had it two games to one at the Garden and lost that game four at the Garden. So, you know, I, all I remember was I mean, that was one of the best games I've ever played in. I don't know how you felt, Mike. It was just like I looked. I watched the video of it later later uh, more recently, and it's like wow, that was an incredible game. Like the energy level, like the overtime started. And even the play-by-play and the color guys were saying this just hasn't stopped. It's just constantly yeah, happening. So, uh, yeah, you're you're obviously very disappointed. And, and for us, it just got to the point that almost every year we're losing. Maybe it was every year we lost to the Island, or Islanders ultimately. So, well, that was, that was specifically you remember like Miko Lennon whiffed, right? Yeah. Larry Pady falls. Yeah. yeah. I think Gresh scored a great goal in that game. Yes, he did. Beat Dennis Bufflin. Yeah. Well, well, what was frustrating for me that well, it was maybe the most disappointing uh, day of my career because Herb Brooks decided not to dress me. Oh, I didn't. I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. So I'm sitting in the stand in the in the press box watching the show. And it, oh, and I forgot all about that. Yeah. It's so he killing. Helped. It's absolutely I'm helping killing me. And I still remember that game that because Gresh had been benched two or three right. games before that. Dave Maloney too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And when Gresh scored, he looked up at the press box and gave us a wave. Oh, oh is that right? And so I still you, you, that. you okay. played every other game though, right? In the series? No, no. I missed. I think the the one or two before that. Herb's. Again, didn't think I was doing the job defensively, and, and oh, I, so I he put it. Let, let so I fully yeah. understand, but it it, it killed me because I because I remember Miko Lennon, and yeah, as you said, Tom had this glorious scoring chance, and the first thing in, in, that I'm thinking of, if that was me, it was in the net. Right. Very, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's funny how things, and 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 I still remember that moment when when Miko had that great chance. I'm going. Yeah. Why couldn't that have been me? Well, couldn't have been me. So no, I, I forgot all about that. So, but you started off the, your relationship with Herb was pretty good when you first got there, wasn't it? Really good, and then it just went on a downward spiral. Like I, it yeah. just, yeah, it, it, it uh, geez, it's awful to say, but I, 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 I there's nobody I, I, I ever didn't like in my career. That was one person I disliked. Yeah. I, I you know just, yeah, you know what's interesting because I'm. And, and yeah. that was, and, and I'm not putting all the blame on him, but he completely took any fun I had in the game away from me. Because, and, and, you know, I, I, I know I wasn't good defensively. And, but, you know, I think when you're a 100 point scorer, you, you put up yeah. with those defensive lapses. And Herb decided that, and, and Herb's ego was one of the biggest that I'd ever seen. And he decided that I was going to be his whipping boy for some reason. And yeah. I still remember Phil Esposito was always saying that, uh, when I used to run into him doing the radio or he see people, he go, yeah, this is Mikey Rogers. Uh, you know, her Brooks tried to change him into a checker from a hundred point guy. And yeah. that was kind of Herb's whole philosophy with me that, uh, you know, if, if I couldn't do what he wanted me to do, um, and I, I try to change. I try to, and you know, it just that wasn't my game. So it, right. uh, I, you know, I, I firmly believe if Herb Brooks hadn't been there, my career might have been longer. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too because I was one of his boys. He just loved me. So you know that by for because well, you it, sucked up to him all the time. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. It worked. Yeah. There it is. For God's sake. Do you remember? Do you remember the one, <laughs> one practice? You and I drank green cream de month. Remember that. That green stuff. I don't know if you remember this, Tommy. No, I remember. I remember. Herb Brooks would, and so we're having a, a just a practice in the morning. And Herb Brooks comes up, and Tommy and I are, are skating beside one another. And, and Herb Brooks comes up to us, and, and Tommy and I both at the same time stick out our tongues at him. And you got these <laughs> green, green tongues, and he just looks at us, shakes his head, and skates oh, away. You know, you remember that. But... Oh, yeah, totally. So we had this place called the pub and you know, we'd park our cars. Some guys would try to hide their car someplace. And I was, I was cocky. I just parked right in front of the place and her, her would come by and he, uh, he would drive by the place to see whose cars were at the, at the bar. He came to me one time at practice. He says, I drove by there at four o'clock and your, your car was still right in front of the bar. I said, yeah, if you drove by at six, it would still be there too. Wow. So, look at you. Oh, well, but I was one of, like Mike said, I was one of his boys. I can get away with that kind of stuff. And I yelled at him. I said, listen, I'm going to be your hardest worker here today. And if I'm not, then you can say something. Otherwise leave me alone. So, yeah. It's just, it's it's one of the best thing. moments, too, of, 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 of the Herb Brooks uh, saga is that um, I think it was after that Kenny Morrow had scored. We ended up at the pub that, that yeah. late that night, and yeah. Herb Brooks actually showed up. Right. I don't know if you remember that, Tommy. And, uh, and why? Geez, it's, how, it's funny how you remember guys. There was a guy that used to, 
he was a mailman. Bob, Bob, Bob Bender. Bob Bender. Bob Bender. Exactly. Was that the night he threw, is this the night he threw he up threw our up shoes? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought it was a different night. I've been telling that story that it was a different night. I didn't realize it was that no, late. No, it was oh. after we'd lost out in the playoffs. And yeah, and he, you know, we always bitch to complain about Herb. So Bobby had, had enough beer in him that he decided he was going to tell Herb oh. Brooks when he called out of him and got one word out of his mouth and threw up. Oh, and remember, because we were sitting there wow. watching the whole thing. And wow. Bob Bender was a great guy, but he was kind of like the big Ranger fan. And actually, I think he kind of liked her, but he was mad at him. But we were watching Bob Bender, and he must have been drinking and eating all night because he, as soon as he gets to Herb, and Herb's only in there for like five minutes. Oh, it might yeah. have been the first time they were in the place. He hated the place. And uh, we could see Bender was like, you know, he's got to, you know, he's got to throw up. Oh, go, no. He's going to blow. He's going to blow. <laughs> and they went all over Herb's shoes. That's glad I remember that. How did he handle it? What did Herb do? He left. I think he left, right? Didn't he? Yeah. Did he, go he, no, he went to the back room, and I think there was a little hose. He washed his uh, pants and, and shoes off and turned around and walked out the door. So here's, here's his dedicated team that he has that he skates and conditions and discipline and everything. And this is the place they're hanging out at. But Mike, Mike, just a little bit of you had to, had to be a little bit happy when he got puked on that night, right? Like, oh, I, it was one of the best moments of the whole playoffs. <laughs> I was a fan, so God, it was a highlight for me. Oh, God, that's funny. I remember that. But again, I thought it was a different night, but you're right. It was. It was but, well, look, the guy was a genius, but that's clearly a, an error there because you don't you don't take a 100-point score at the sitting on the Yeah, and you know, and, and Mike knows this too. For whatever reason, Herb would just pick on certain guys. And, he, and for whatever reason, he just – there's other guys like uh, Mike Allison he didn't like necessarily either. I remember, I remember Mike yeah. Allison was like a real good team guy and before a game – he was trying to get the guys going and everything. And Herb came in and told him to shut up, I think. Like, he, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing talking? Like, shut up. So, uh, yeah, he, he did, uh, whether he was right or wrong, he did ha, did things for a reason. It wasn't just random. Like, there's some reason he didn't like Mike anymore because he liked him at first. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, how, how many years? My roommate, you got rid of me eventually. So, I guess it's, it's wait, wait, hold, be with me and not Herb. Wait, hold on a second. Well, you guys were roommates? Oh, yeah. yeah, we're roommates. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. We, uh. Those mini bars in the room, man. We beat those up. We met as a tour. We yeah, uh, we had a lot of fun. Mike, did Layla do anything ridiculous, like break a stick over his head or put his head through a table or anything like not, that? Not that. That was college. I saved that for college. Uh, that's where you got the nickname Ledge, right? The, oh, there we go. Ledge. <laughs> we were at an event down in Philly, and Tom got witness of that. But, so it was a guy. Some guy wrote an article that I was a legend in my own time up in Marquette, Michigan. And then you guys, the older guys, got that. They go, "Oh, here we go. Oh, the yeah. legend is of mind." Yeah. Do you remember that the one night we uh, we we didn't have the key for the bar fridge because they knew they couldn't give Tommy and I the key, and so <laughs> we got home after a few drinks. And and hey, Tommy, the one thing I can say we never ever broke curfew. We were nope. and I, and our whole team. You know, we, yeah. we we all went out as a group, but we were always back to make sure that we were ready yeah. for the next night for a game or whatever. But we decided we needed a couple more drinks and. And we couldn't get into the bar fridge. So I don't know, did we have a, a spoon or a knife or something? We worked on that bar fridge for probably 15, 20 minutes. And then, oh my God. And then two idiots, we grab them all in our hands. And if you ever seen like uh, movies where they rob a bank and they get all the cash and they throw it in the air and, and they're lying on the bed and all the cash lands on them, well, here's two idiots lying in their bed throwing little miniatures up in the air. Landed on it was like you broke into a bank. Oh god, we we were like little kids having fun. Yeah, and, and if ten year old me would have been privy to that, I, you guys wouldn't have been heroes at that point, man. Oh no, no, you were no, it would be more of a hero because we do it and then play the next night. But that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. you're right. It is like again, it's hard for people to understand, but it was uh, when you're going through it. That is really like that bonding stuff. Like Mike and I were really close. The whole team was close. And part it was just the alcohol. And, and I don't really believe, maybe you know, science will tell you differently that the alcohol didn't help us, but. As far as like the code was that you play guilty. If you're all going to be out together, we all know what each other did. So don't let it affect your game. And I, I don't, I don't recall ever. Well, what happened if one of you guys was just dragging it the next day? Did you pick each other up? Like how did that, how did that go? Well, we lost him, but big Willie was like that. Willie Huber. Uh, sometimes he would come to practice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think guys would push him, but we also like as much as Willie was a big guy that didn't play like a big guy, he was a good teammate too. Like really, really oh, yeah. skilled player, really play hard. So I think we just really all, we all supported him. And uh, I, I just, I, I just recall us having a great team like that, so we didn't let that kind of stuff bother. But you know, come game time, you know, have to make sure everybody's ready to go. So we wouldn't just point at Willie, but we make sure everybody's ready to play. And at that time, the coaches didn't have to come into our locker room and get us ready to play. Right? We we got ourselves ready to play. Don't you think? Exactly. No, no. And if, if somebody wasn't playing, we took it upon ourselves to let the guy know. We didn't need the coach to come in and, and start weaving on a guy and that sort of thing. But, you know, it, it's funny, Tommy, and, and 
you know, I, I, I don't want our listeners to think we were, that's all we did and drink and have fun, but we had fun. We really did. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I did the radio for the flames for 12 years and flew with the team and stayed in the same hotels. And so this was from the year 2000 to 2012. And the first thing I noticed, there was just no joy in the players. Yeah. It was really amazing to watch those guys. And, and the, the, the play by play guy, a guy by the name of Peter Marr, who's in the, the hockey hall of fame. He's yeah. one of the greatest play by play guys ever. He, uh, him and I would be down in the lobby and we'd go for dinner and we'd watch the players and two players would go this way and one player would go this way and four players. Ooh. I never, ever saw the team go out as a group for dinner. Right. And I said, you know, that's why they made the playoffs in two years. Yeah. Yeah. Of the yeah. 12 years I did it, twice they made the playoffs. One year they went to the Stanley Cup Finals with uh, with Jerome McGinley and Mika Kippersoff being the stars they were. But, you know, it, it's yeah. funny. And that, that's that's what I look back at our careers and and – you know, it, it gets past the points and, 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 and you know, and, and the personal accolades and all that sort of stuff. It's it's your teammates and the fun you had with yeah. teammates. And I yeah. think that really lacks in today's game. Yeah. When I was in the agent business, Donald Fair, who'd been the head of the Major League Baseball right, Player yeah. Association, yeah, he took over with the NHLPA. And he was trying to implement implement, implement this rule where nice players – yeah, I got that word. Oh, nice one. job. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's, so, it's English. So, yeah, it's like, I have a hard time with English, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was trying to have a rule, use have instead of implement there. <laughs> so uh, where they get each player could have his own room, a single room. And I tried to say to him, I said, "You're really changing the culture of the game by doing that." And he just—it wasn't his fault. He just didn't understand. I tried to explain to him part of the great thing about being on an NHL team is having that roommate, that fun with, uh, you know, and even when in tough times to have that room because you became close. You traveled yeah, around a lot, and you became really good friends, like Mike and I did. Uh, so. But again, right? It's and I think the money. Don't you think the money has changed so much too? Where you oh, get one guy that's make yeah, one guy's making ten million a year. The other's making seven hundred thousand. Yeah, but you guys had that discrepancy. Just not the numbers weren't as, as high, but you had that discrepancy. Yeah, but when a guy's making three hundred and another guy's making sixty, you know, it really doesn't. You're not living in a different stratosphere. It's you know, yeah, not that great angle. I think you're right. Just getting back to the salary thing. It it it, it you know, it, as you said, the discrepancy wasn't that much between the top player and the bottom player, but. You know, I, sure, we, we did play for the money, but it wasn't the be-all, end-all. Yeah. You know, we played because we wanted to be professional players. And I, and I yeah. think that the players nowadays have got caught up so much in, in, in how much money they're making and, and how many years they can make this money and everything else. And I, I think sometimes their, their on-ice performance suffers a bit. Yeah. And how many guys have we seen? And I'm seeing it here with the Flames. Jonathan Huberto, who had a fantastic year last year. Is going to get less than half the points he got last year. He signed, I think, a ten million eight or ten million yeah. eight year contract, yep. and all of a sudden you're complacent. You've got all this money, and and you know, and I, I give them credit. They work hard to get to that that point, but then they forget about you know why why they got that money. It's about yeah. performance on the ice, and and I, I think they get so much caught up in the money. Yeah, for us too, like you're saying, that for me, I just wanted to get the most out of my career, like you too, right? I mean, you're yeah. proud of being right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys did well with with the money, but yeah, like Mike said, it's ridiculous money now. Yes, yeah. it's cr it's crazy money. Right. Yeah, you think of a guy making ten million dollars, flying around private jets and everything, and the guy making seven hundred thousand or eight hundred thousand. You know, it's not awful. It's just not compared to ten million. It's, it's very well for yeah. normal people. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Mike, how many years did you go total in in the NHL? Come to WHA, twelve years. Twelve years. So, if you look back, are you happy with that? Would you like if you were to look at the start before before you're an eight year old boy, say if I get twelve years of pro hockey, that's pretty good. Well, first of all, you look at uh, if you can even think of playing one game in, in yeah. pro hockey, you know, and then all of a sudden now you, you make it. And, and you know, I, I never looked at, at how long I wanted to play. I looked at how he performed each and every year. Yeah. And, and, you know, as I said, in the 12 years and, and the last couple of years, my, my skills start to started to go down. And, you know, for a guy like me that was small, um, couldn't check for his life. And, See, I don't oh, recall it. Be, I don't recall you being that bad of a defensive. Oh, player. I wasn't good, Tommy. I never saw you until we went back to our room. I never was in my own end. So <laughs> you being a defenseman, God, if you couldn't get the puck to me at center ice, I wasn't coming back. So maybe that's why I didn't notice that you're a bad defensive player. That's right. <laughs> well, Mike, you, you brought up a great point, though, Mike. What made you, as a smaller guy, what made, especially in that era, what made you so effective? Um, I think because. For so long, when you're when you're my size, you always hear that word "can't." He can't make it because he's too small. He can't make it because of this. Can't make it because of this. So, 
you actually come and, and, and you play with a chip on your shoulder. And I, I remember when I finished my career in the WHA and we went into the NHL, even the, the New England Whalers, who had led their team in scoring, weren't sure if I could play in the NHL. Wow. And I ended up signing a two-way contract um, that year. And so that summer I got in the, in, 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 I was always out of shape. That also, that was a big problem with me, but I got in, in pretty good shape and I just dedicated myself to being the best player I could be going into the NHL. And, uh, and just, as I said, I had a hundred point season and, and not in my wildest dreams going into the NHL that year that I thought that could happen. So, you know, it just shows when you, when you dedicate yourself and you have that drive and, and, and yeah. want to prove people wrong, it, it, it th that was the driving force for me. And, and, uh, you know, then, then ended up having a pretty good career. Yeah. yeah. So everybody doesn't know the two-way contract means that you get a certain amount of money at the NHL level. If you get sent to the minors, you make less. Uh, usually it's like in that twenty-five, thirty, forty thousand 30000 dollars range. Uh, so it's a big right. difference. And, and back then, you, you signed bonuses. And uh, and I think nowadays, unless you're over 32 years old or you're a rookie, you don't, you can't, you don't get performance yeah. bonuses. Yeah. Well, that year I had, uh, I signed bonuses. And as I said, we were making a lot of money back then, but I signed a bonus of I got 80 points, I got $10,000, 90 points, another $1,000 or $10,000, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So I got 100 points, so I got $30,000 nice. bonus, but also that got added onto my contract the next year. Oh, cool. Nice. So that I did it for three years. So all of a sudden yep. now in, in those three years, uh, you know, $90,000 $90, in bonuses and $90,000 extra in the contract. So again, I... I I think that drove me a little bit too. Is is that my my contract was performance laden, and so that that made me, you know, made me play a little harder. Well, you know, it's funny too because I again I, I did not realize you're a bad defensive player. I do remember you being a very competitive player in your way. It wasn't like you were going to go pu punch somebody in the head, but when you decided you want to score, you like you you joke around about getting mad and sulking and all that kind of stuff. But it was on the ice like you would get mad like and, and you go out and try to you know score get points right. Yeah, no, no, thanks, Tommy, for that. Yeah, you know, I, I make fun of myself defensively, and and you know, I I, I worked at it. I, I I tried to be as good as I possibly could, but you know, that that really wasn't my focus. So right. when I in, in, when I'm saying that, it's because you know, I I, I wanted to be better offensively than defensively. Yeah. But yeah, and I I I, I, I did play with a chip at, at times, you know. Yeah, and sure. if I can take advantage of that, that kind of, and I think it it should spur any player yeah. to, to be cool. better in that next shift and so on and so on. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, just so you know, too, I don't recall as teammates, myself or other guys looking at you like you're some kind of liability defense. We just, I thought you were just a great team player. And that's, I think most of the guys looked at you that way, too. So, but well, I wish Herb Brooks would have looked at it that way. Why didn't you tell him you were his best yeah. buddy? No, I think it wasn't Nikki his best buddy. I thought Nikki, oh, hold, hold on, suck up. hold on, suck up. Let's hear this. Let's hear this. No, I didn't see that's the thing. I think he liked me because I didn't suck up to him, right? I mean, he shot a puck in my head one time at practice, too. That wouldn't have hurt you. Good point, but you know. You know what, though, Tommy, you just went out and played the game the same way each and every night. Yeah. Yeah. No skill. No, no, no. You knew what your game was. And I don't know if it's ever been brought up on your show, but I still remember that game in Boston where I'm sitting beside you on the bench and, and you look like hell. You are white and you go to me and I'm not feeling that good. And you go out to the next shift and, and, it's like you're just standing there swinging your stick and you couldn't move, couldn't move. You ended up in the hospital that night with a yeah. ruptured spleen. You were yeah. playing a few shifts with that ruptured spleen. And I says, yeah. you know, there's a guy that you got to admire that uh, loves the game so much you were out doing that. God. Okay, that's enough praise I'm going to give you. That's, no, it. No, that's, it. that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. My head can't get any bigger. <laughs> so uh, apparently Literally. then, how, did you have a couple of daughters? I can't remember now. Three daughters? Right. The three daughters, two are living in Calgary. Uh, the youngest one, I guess the youngest one now, she's 30, about 34, 32. I don't know what she oh, is. Oh, wow. wow. But uh, yeah, so two of them are living in Calgary. The youngest one's living in New Zealand. I've got uh, four grandsons. Wow. So our Good weekends, job. you're hockey, hockey, hockey. You know, in, right. in, in, in Canada, in, in the cities, that you, you, there's quadrants. So northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. And, and there's days that uh, Anne and I, my wife, uh, are, are in all four different quadrants in one day. And was one of the sweetest women too. I know how you got Anne. Like she's one of the sweetest people that's ever landed on this planet. Forty-eight years married this summer. Wow. She's well, I think was, she's probably really attracted to you that night where I brought you home throwing up uh, the night of my stay. <laughs> she probably said, "I'm a lucky woman." Like I'm. I'm, one I'm in. This is my guy. <laughs> how did I land this man right here? I had one like. Uh, did you uh, bring yeah. Ari Mike home? Like, yeah, I'd carry him. He was throwing up. <laughs> it was a trail of throw up going into the fridge. 
Isn't that what oh, the best man's supposed to do? No, the best man's yeah. supposed to look after the groom. Oh, yeah. God. For some oh. reason, it was the other way around. <laughs> that was yeah. funny. Another funny time was when you, I came out to go to the Stampede. I stayed at your place, the Calgary oh. Stampede. Well, that was when, yeah. Oh, if you guys ever want to have fun, go to the Calgary Stampede. That was one great party. You should go when you're sick. But yeah. I just had a kid. Like, I think. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Dana yeah. was. Yeah. So, so, the, <laughs> so Tommy and I are going out and Stampede's a crazy, crazy oh, yeah. time. So, so Tommy and I, are, and I are going out every day and I'm trying to get home. I'm leaving Tommy out at night most of the time by himself. But no, he's probably fine with that. <laughs> my, my wife, my wife, Ann decides, okay, she wants to just, just get away from us and, and leave the, leave our daughter. So she asked Tommy and I to, to look after her. Oh, that's yeah, right. He, yes. no, we, this is, we, I don't know how many bear we had and we watched the Alamo on TV and my little daughter slept the whole time. And as soon as Ann walks in the door, my daughter woke up, Tommy, I grabbed my daughter, gave her to my wife. Tommy and I walked out the door, and uh, <laughs> she went to Tommy, but she was never so happy to see you leave. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. We had one night where I stayed out all night. I uh, came home yeah. like it's like nine in the morning. I figured, okay, I'm going to go to bed now. Mike's raring to go. So they get, they get going in the morning there. They, they shut down the offices and they have parties out on the street in the morning. They're drinking vodka and orange juice and everything. So we go to the uh, St. Was it, we were out for a while. Was it the St. Louis Hotel we went to eventually? Oh, that, oh yeah. Uh, I said, right. okay, we're now this is now lunchtime. We figured, okay, just have a few beers here. We're gonna go home, and have a nap. The, they had the shots going, and after you drink your shot, then you had to smack it on the ground. You had to break it on the on the uh, floor. Oh, wow. oh, was Tom wearing his phony cowboy hat? I think. Oh, he had, he had the hat, and he always wore the cowboy boots, even when he played. Yeah. He had the suit yeah. and cowboy boots. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I saw an old picture of that too. There's a picture of all the defensemen on the team there. I was standing there with the cowboy boots on, the suit, and all that. Yeah. <laughs> And I thought it was cool too. So well, obviously, I always think I'm cool. Yeah, still do. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, what was the business that you got in after you got done with the radio work? What are you doing now? Well, you know, in Calgary, it was about uh, you know we're kind of the oil and gas company or, or capital of Canada. So, you know, I, I started doing jobs and sales with that sort of thing. But uh, about six years ago, uh, got with a group, and our company is called Scorched Ice. And what we developed is a sensor for the hockey stride. So we. Sh We'll probably be bringing it to market here quite uh, quite soon. We still got a little tweaks that we have to do, but so really, what it does, it, it straps onto your your boot skate. It weighs next to nothing. You don't even know you have it on, and it fits in the opening of of the blade holder. Sure. And uh, so you turn it on before you go on the ice, and then after you step off the ice, it breaks down everything you had to do with your stride. So um, intensity, force, um, crossovers, left foot compared to right foot, stopping, starting, everything else. So um, we've okay. we've gained a lot of traction. We've talked to the NHL, some NHL teams. Um, we've talked to uh, a ton of junior teams, triple midget A teams, high level teams, and uh, yeah, as I said, we're we're pretty excited. Um, we have a, a deal set up with CCM. Um, they're going to be our marketing arm. Um, probably starting next year. So we're probably going to go to market on our own this year. So if anybody is interested in looking at uh, kind of our products, it's www.scorchedice.ca. And it's, uh, it's really exciting. It, it, it's, it's, you know, I, That's cool. I, I think That's every, yeah. every kid can use it and, and find something that's going to help them become a nice. better skater. And as we all know, hockey is now skiing. Yeah. You know, that's what you need to, did like, you think of that? We actually got the rights for their, uh, I, I don't know if you ever heard it. It was called the, jeez, uh, it was a heated blade. And they had oh, yeah. a battery pack. Yeah. 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 We got yeah. the rights for that. And my partner was in a, a bunch of different businesses. He met with a guy and told him about what we had, this heated blade. And this guy had been in sensor technology his whole life. He says, well, you know what? Maybe we can carry this a step further. Wow. You know, Very and cool. so we kind of put the heated blade on the back burner and, and now have developed the sensor. So, uh yeah, pretty exciting. We we've uh, kids are loving it. We we've, we've been having tons and tons of teams and players using it, and uh, yeah. So you know, and and the game's about analytics and data now. Yeah, in totally. any sport. And so yeah. now all of a sudden, instead of somebody telling you, they have the proof. Here it is. They can show you. You know, sure. this is what you need to improve on. So we think we think it's good. It's 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 going to take off. And Mike, you you would connect via like an app for that, and and. Just download. exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. You you can get it on your phone, your iPad, your computer, um, and yeah, as soon as you're ready to look it up, you'll you'll see how you did that day, and it's an everyday thing. So you know, you can see your progress. You can see as as pro teams have told us what they're excited about it is yeah. you you see, and all of a sudden you, you you're it starts to drop off. Well, this guy could be injured. 
Because as we know, I mean, players are never going to tell the coach or yeah. the manager they're yep. injured. So all of a sudden, maybe they can address that. So there's, it's not only just on ice performance, but it also kind of gives you, you know, where that guy is, 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 is he getting better? Is he getting worse? And if he's getting worse, sure. why? There's got to be a reason. Right. So, so it's like a, yeah. it's like a Fitbit for skating. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you're an intelligent man. Right. Well, I get up with that. NYU is <laughs> That's right. Um, so one of the strong suits of Mike Rogers too is the, his loyalty. So you have a friend of yours that you've been friends with, that your kids, right? Who is it? What was his name again? Oh, Norm. Little Norm. Norm. Yeah, he's he's your husband. husband. Why do you That's think I was his buddy all those years? <laughs> he's a good guy too. He's still around. Oh, we see each other a lot. He uh, okay. unfortunately he lost his wife. Uh, oh, he's two three years ago, and oh. uh, so he went through a pretty uh, pretty tough time, but. Yeah, Norm's now out of the liquor business, and uh, but we still see each other an awful lot. Oh, he's a, he's actually, a no his, his 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 son is married to one of my daughters. I that's I heard that I, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, so that came about. So yeah, so we even uh, see each other a lot more. So yeah, so, okay, let me get this. Let me yeah, get you this saw him, Tom. He's such yeah. a good guy. So let me get the street. He doesn't sell liquor anymore. No, right? Okay. Yeah, so he, what's just, the he just turned seventy-five. What's, so he's uh, what's the, well. What's the purpose though? If he's not selling liquor anymore, why are you hanging around with him? Well, that's it. I don't see him as right. near as much as I used to. Okay. But, okay. Yeah, yeah. But he still provides. He, he he's he used to do the uh, rodeos. So he'd go oh, all, yeah. well, you remember that? He used to go to all yeah. these different rodeos and sell their product. Yeah. So he retired from that last year, but he, he still sneaks in and steals booze because we oh, go on a golf trip, so we need booze. So he goes and steals all that. So, oh, yeah, he's still got that going for him. That's one of the reasons. How, How old are you now? He's, I'm 68, so he's, yeah, 69 this year, really? 70 next year. My God. Wow, we made it this old up. Crazy. Oh, we, yeah, did, we, pickled our, we pickled ourselves we back did. then. <laughs> Way to turn off our young listeners. Jesus. We bring it down. Uh, that's you guys are 8 and 12. You're, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah, that's right. We took care right. of ourselves. Yes. So any regrets at all, Mike? You know, you can ask that a lot. And, and you know, not a one. Yeah. You know, I, I think if there's one regret that I have, um, when my career ended, I played my last year in Switzerland mm-hmm. and the Olympics were here in 88 in Calgary. So I came back from playing in Switzerland and I was asked to play for the Olympic team. Oh, wow. But I was done. I just, wow. I, you know, the enjoyment of the game and also I was going to be gone all that year. You know, I had, I had two young daughters at that time and I was going to be gone because the, 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 Team Hockey Canada, Team Canada never really had a home uh, home ice or home rink or whatever. So they were going to be on the road for a pretty well a year. I didn't want to be away from my daughters. Yeah. We bought some land in 1980. We wanted to build a house. But I look back, like, what a thrill that would have been to play in your yeah. hometown in the Olympics. Yeah, So, true. no, that's just one of those things that was uh, maybe a bad decision. But, you know, I, I, I kind of wish my career could have been a little bit longer, but it, it was what it was. And, yeah. uh, you know, as, as I said, Tommy, you know, guys like you and guys that I met along the way. And that that's that's what I'll always cherish. I, I don't, you know, the hockey's almost secondary. And, you know, it's it's still about about the guys I got to know. Is that true? The era, the era that we played in, like that was like a fun time. Like it was a hard time. The game was hard, a lot of fighting, a lot of violence. But, man, we, we lived all out, uh, on and off the ice. Everybody lived all out. You know, and, 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 and you know, like as for myself personally, I mentioned Dave Keon and Gordy Howell. I, you know, I also played with... You know, the first goalie I ever played with in pro hockey was Jacques Plante. You know, oh, Jacques Plante's yeah. famous for wearing the mask. And, uh, you know, Bobby Hull, who I, I got to play with for a short period in Hartford. So, you know, it, it's the friendships that, you know, here, here's my idols. But, it, it's, you know, the first day you ever meet those guys, they're not your idols anymore. They're, they're your friends yeah. and teammates. And that, that was, the, I think, the really cool thing about the older guys in our era, that yeah. they really took the younger guys under their wings. And and they were kids at heart. They they just wanted to have fun and keep playing, and and they knew how lucky they were to prolong their their careers. But yeah, I I just loved every minute of it. Isn't it true those old guys was real like the Bobby Halls? I played with Larry Robinson at the end of his career out in L.A. Same thing. He was like a little kid out there, and I just idolized him. And I I got around him. And was like, man, this is fun. Like he just he just loves playing. Yeah, and the work ethic they had also. You yeah. know, if, if you see a guy that's you know for Gordy Howe who is fifty years old, you see him out working you. It kind of gives you a bit yeah. of a wake up call that you know. He might have a heart attack on the ice, but still, you know, you got to make sure that you work harder. Well, Mike, you were obviously one of my all-time favorite teammates on and off the ice. Uh, I had a great time. It was an honor to have you as the best man in my failed marriage. Uh, maybe if I get married again, I'll uh, give you a call. Tom just dropping hints on us that he might be getting married soon. So pay attention. Stay, stay tuned, Mike. Might need to have a trip out to New York. But no puking this time. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's right. No. no drinking at the wedding. No, no, no. No, I quit that a long time ago. No, I have. Have you quit drinking? No. Oh, you had, oh God, yeah. I was going to say, you're a quitter. Like, <laughs> quit quitting, apparently. <laughs> yeah. So, seriously, uh, I really, I love you. Uh, you're a fantastic human being. You're a big part of my life back then, uh, both on and off the ice. And thank you very much for doing the show, and it's great to see you again. Yeah, back at you, Tommy. Jeez, it's right. great to see you, and uh, we got to keep in touch. Yes, we definitely do. Yes. Okay. All right, brother. The two times. Thank right. you very much. All right, Good to see you. What a fun talk with, oh. uh, with your old buddy there, your room, your uh, roadie. I, your I got fired up there when he came on because remind all the fun times we had together and everything. Yeah, you, uh, were, Mikey you, Roger. you were, you know, here, you're giggling like a little school oh, kid, man. Totally. That was great. Uh, I remember some of the fun times we had. Like, we were like little kids when we were together, uh, roomed together, played together. He was my best man. Uh, <laughs> no, it was awesome. And, you know, you, as people who listen to us know, you're like a size bully. Like, you know, you know always make fun of people shorter than yeah. you, like myself. Mike. Yeah. For me, as a you know, like I said, I'm five ten. He was what is he five seven? Yeah, not very big. Yeah, not very big. So him and Pav back yep. in the day, like those yeah. those guys were idols to me because I was a smaller guy, and they yeah. the, the, what they went through and your well, would you era, call me a, a size bully? You're like a size me? bully. Like, hey, oh look, that, look is, at that little guy. Oh, that guy's small with you. What you know, God, God you blessed, make up these things. God blessed you with that six foot two frame and gigantic head, and now you think you know you're There's a lot going on in that head. Is it a lot going on in there? There's a lot of echo. Is that the mic or is that anyway? But no, he was great, and you guys, you could tell you guys still have yeah. 40 30 years yeah. love each other yeah. and that was awesome man it was yeah. great to, great yeah. to be part of that see back it's funny i like i said because we're guys but we can go for like 30 years without talking to each other and then all of a sudden get back together it's like because nah, no you want low maintenance friendships you don't need high maintenance friendships right <laughs> that is correct and that then, is totally correct and he was awesome and he what a great player too yeah, yeah he was and, and he i listen i don't remember him as being a bad defensive player he talked about that a lot yeah, I just viewed him as being a real competitive guy. That yeah, was an offensive player, but it wasn't a liability. But, defensively. but think about that. I think the Rangers maybe have like seven or eight hundred point seasons in their in their whole history. Yeah, and he's he's one of them. Yeah, totally. And that's awesome. Yeah, good player, good teammate. Yeah, we had fun times back then. He was part of the team. The early eighties were just a great bunch of guys. Yeah, it was yeah. Fun. No, it was great show, Ledge. Yeah. <laughs> All right, grasshoppers, thank you for listening. We had a fantastic show. We'll see you next time. Schwab Trading is now powered by Ameritrade to give you a new, elevated trading experience tailor-made for trader minds. Go deeper with Thinkorswim, the powerful, award-winning trading platforms now at Schwab. Unlock support from the Trade Desk, our team of passionate traders who live and breathe trading like you do. And sharpen your skills with an expanding library of online education crafted just for traders. All designed to help you trade brilliantly. Learn more at schwab.com trading.